And here we are with Melanie Phillips. Hello, Melanie. Hello, Abby. I understand that you are right now, uh, you were just in Berkeley College recently. I saw you made a video on the campus of Berkeley, and you were seeing firsthand the state of free speech on U.S. college campuses. Indeed. What uh, indeed, Avi, I'm on a lecture tour in America. I'm actually speaking to you uh, from Minneapolis at this very moment, from a hotel room in Minneapolis. Um, but I was in Berkeley uh, last week uh, on the campus there, and I had been invited to speak to Jewish students about uh, Israel. I've been invited to speak to them specifically to put arguments before them and facts and evidence to help them defend Israel because they're so beleaguered on campus. And I'd originally been invited by Berkeley Hillel, um, but then I was promptly disinvited because in the wake of the great campus uh, riots at Berkeley over the invitation uh, to the provocative journalist Milo Yiannopoulos and then the equally provocative journalist Anne Coulter to speak, um, Berkeley Hillel decided that it was too dangerous for me to speak there. Can you imagine? Too dangerous for me to speak to Jewish students at Berkeley Hillel. So I was uh, invited instead uh, to uh, another uh, venue, which was in fact a kind of safe house. Would you believe a safe house had to be found for me on Berkeley campus? And I will not divulge where that was. And I met there, uh, I spoke there to a smaller number of students, about, in fact, about 100 bravely turned up. Um, and they had to be coaxed to turn up, uh, individually contacted, to reassure them it would be entirely safe for them to turn up. Because the terrible situation is that Jewish students on Berkeley campus, and I expect this is true elsewhere as well, but Berkeley is particularly bad. Jewish students at Berkeley are now too frightened to attend presentations given by um, either conservative or pro-Israel speakers. And this situation is, is really quite out of hand. And it's not just Berkeley. Uh, while I was there, uh, I was told of another incident that had happened just a few days previously at another college uh, called Kenyatta College. Uh, in fact, this was, uh, I think, uh, uh, elsewhere in, in California. Um, and um, that college had invited uh, Rabbi Daniel Lapin to speak. Now, he'd been invited to speak uh, about an apparently completely uncontentious topic um, which was the uh, something like the, um, the moral lessons or the moral purpose of capitalism. He was giving a talk on economics and he was shouted down for approximately 20 minutes, I was told, by a number of students who screamed at him that he was uh, an Islamophobe and a homophobe and every other kind of phobe and above all, a white supremacist. Eventually, uh, there were some uh, university authorities there. And apparently, one of these university bigwigs was approached uh, by somebody or people who said, look, you are the university authority. Do something. I mean, this is just a few students who are shouting this man down. Throw them out. Take action against them. And the university authorities refused to do so. And one apparently said, this protest will be brought to an end when this meeting is abandoned. In other words, they were not doing anything to take action. They were taking no action against the students. And they're basically standing effectively with folded arms while this mayhem continued. And this man was prevented from speaking. This is on a university campus, which is supposed to be the place where you have free expression of ideas. Eventually, apparently somebody said, look, there's a back room. And people very, very discreetly and quietly peeled off as if they were just leaving the meeting. And they went to this back room and eventually gave his presentation, effectively in secret, again, ridiculous. Um, and what's happening is uh, really a disturbing situation. You have students who are completely out of control, students who are intent on uh, suppressing uh, by every means possible, including violence, uh, speakers with whom they disagree. And that uh, disagreement extends over a very wide range of topics. But the real um, uh, uh, villains of the piece, if you like, the people for, on whom responsibility for this state of affairs devolves uh, are, of course, the university authorities, the faculty and the administrators, 
who are doing nothing to stop this. They are simply taking no action. Sometimes because they actually agree with what the protesters are saying, as in the case of the demonization of Israel and other topics, but select because they're simply frightened. They don't want to get you involved. They want to basically run away from this situation. And those university authorities, in my view, should be being held to account uh, for the appalling way in which they are turning the university campus, which should be the crucible of free expression of ideas, into a place of bullying and the extinction of free ideas and the repudiation of reason itself. And this is happening up and down cam on campuses up and down America. So it, it's very interesting that you went there. And I want to ask you a question. Regardless of the, content the, the content contentious issues that can be spoken about on campus, what do you think this is doing? What do you think these universities and, and professional university uh, employees, presidents, administrations, these actions, what's it going to do for the future of America? These, these are the future. These kids who are being taught that there is no freedom of, of expression anymore. What is it going to do for the future of America? Well, the first thing is that uh, a whole generation of uh, young people uh, is going to be left badly educated. They will not be exposed to ideas because it's quite clear that it's not simply occasional speakers that are being howled down. Uh, there is a, an atmosphere on campus which, in which there are certain ideas that are prohibited, certain ways of looking at the world that are simply prohibited. So we are de-educating our students. They are simply not being taught to think uh, for themselves. They're not being taught how to think critically and deal with a range of competing views, almost by definition. Um, and um, they are being given a set of moral lessons, which are very disturbing. And the main moral lesson they're being given is that power rules, um, that might is right, um, that uh, if, you are, if you want to get your way, um, then the abuse of power is the way to do it. And that's a terrible thing to be teaching uh, young people by, by example. Um, and what also strikes me is the, uh, is the extraordinary um, collapse of understanding uh, of what the American Constitution is and of, what, and of the importance of legality. Um, and this goes far beyond um, uh, students, but uh, just for, to, 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 to uh, look at students again for a moment, when I was on Berkeley, when I was in, in Berkeley, I uh, went to Sproul Plaza, which is the kind of center of Berkeley's campus, where historically, it is said in the 60s, there was a great declaration made preserving or, or upholding freedom of speech, ironically. On Sproul Plaza, uh, when I was there, uh, a student was proclaiming um, a message every few minutes. He was shrieking into a microphone and uh, he was uh, advertising a meeting that was about to take place to protest the uh, invitation to Anne Coulter, this provocative journalist. Anne Coulter had decided not to attend Berkeley because her safety couldn't be guaranteed, but the protest was still going on. Uh, there were, there were both posters around Sproul Plaza saying, you know, defeat fascism at Berkeley, you know, disinvite Anne Coulter. This student was shrieking about the constitution. And what he was saying was, uh, this is not an issue about freedom of speech. Um, there is no right in the constitution to protect the right to speak of Anne Coulter. Uh, she has no constitutional right to speak. It is my constitutional right to be protected from Anne Coulter. Um, uh, this campus at Berkeley has to be rid of white supremacism. The White House has to be rid of white supremacism. Now this is infantile and asinine, um, but this is the, the level at which uh, young people have, have, have reached. And I'm told that young people are simply not taught about the constitution anymore. Um, I mean, some are obviously, but in general, uh, it is very common to find young people who are simply not taught about the institutions of democracy and freedom, and particularly um, the American constitution. Um, and I am very struck by the way in which this is an atmosphere in America now, it's beyond, it's, the whole um, argument, and I've been with a lot of 
uh, uh, ordinary Americans, if you, if, if you like, the kind who voted for President Trump. And what is apparent to me immediately is that the issue of illegal immigration is so important. Um, now these people, uh, it's important to them. Now these people are demonized uh, because it's so important to them. They're demonized as being white racists and nothing can be further from the truth. I mean, some of them may be, but that's not the issue. The issue of illegal immigration is absolutely fundamental because it's illegal and blind eyes are being turned to this. More than blind eyes. I was in, uh, in, in California where they've established sanctuary cities. What are people having sanctuary from? It is sanctuary from the law. You are not proceeded against if you are an illegal immigrant. Uh, and if you are an illegal immigrant that commits a crime, you are not proceeded against in the way that everyone else is proceeded against with the full force of the law. And consequently, you have a system that's, or a, a situation in America that's grown up in which you have institutionalized illegality, uh, which is being connived at and condoned by the authorities of the state. And this is an appalling state of affairs because you are undoing the rule of law. You are undoing the very notion of what citizenship is. If you say we don't care about illegal citizen, I illegal immigrants, and we're going to just, you know, regard them as, as, as just everyone like everybody else, and they will have exactly the same benefits and rights as everybody else. And it's racist, in fact, to say that they shouldn't. You are undoing the basis of citizenship, which is a compact between the individual and the state. The individual signs up to citizenship. The individual undertakes certain things. He, he or she undertakes to live under the rule of law. That's the most fundamental thing. And to basically pay his or her taxes and you know, correspond with what the state demands. And in return, the state gives that individual citizen rights and benefits. That's the bargain. That's what citizenship is. And if you say that illegal immigration is basically to be ignored, or even worse, that illegal immigrants are to be given sanctuary from the law uh, and to have institutionalized their illegality as being okay, then you are undoing the very basis of citizenship and you're thus undoing the very basis of what it is to be a nation. And this is absolutely fundamental. Um, and it is nevertheless, uh, you know, it's, this, this fundamental understanding is what has driven so many people to vote for President Trump. Um, and in my view, this means that those people who are voting, who voted in this way, have declared themselves to be moral and decent and to understand what democracy is and the rule of law. Whereas the people who are shrieking white racists at them are people who are undoing the rule of law and undoing the very basis of the American nation. Yeah. Um, the way you just clarified that issue, I think, is so important, and most people don't get, and you really did a fabulous job of, of, of pinpointing what it is all about. Uh, and since you, you, you already jumped ahead to talk about Trump, let's take that and just jump, jump into Trump and Israel. Just recently, the headlines have been conflicting headlines. Uh, he is moving the, embassy, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. He's not. Crazy stuff going on, a lot of fake news. I had a conversation this morning with someone saying it's all fake news, nothing has been said about it, nothing's been decided about it, even though Trump wants to fulfill the promise. Yes. What do you, where do you think things are going right now with Trump and Israel as an upcoming trip and, and the potential renewing of peace process? What do, you, what do you have to say? Well, I think there is a great deal of fake news. I mean, I've been reading these stories, um, and in fact, I've written uh, my uh, column for the Jerusalem Post uh, uh, to this week um, about this very topic. Um, but um, I mean, what I think is that all these stories that are coming out should be put to one side. Um, this is all spin and hype and journalists getting uh, completely uh, excited and uh, writing a load of rubbish that they know very little about. Um, we don't know uh, uh, the truth of all this, um, uh, and a lot of it seems to me, <clears throat> to me, it seems to me to be um, entirely fanciful. My understanding uh, has always been about this famous um, um, uh, uh, pledge that President Trump made to move the uh, U.S. Embassy in Israel uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. My understanding is that <clears throat> he genuinely and deeply wants to do this, um, and continues to want to do this. And my understanding has always been that it's been Prime Minister ben Benjamin Netanyahu who has stopped him for various reasons, whether he's right or wrong is another matter. Um, but, uh, you know, President Trump is deferring to the person who actually uh, uh, bears the responsibility for uh, dealing with the fallout, such as it would be, of this move. And as far as the peace process is concerned, we can all see what happened. Um, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas was invited to the White House. He was treated very nicely. And the Palestinians have been running around saying how thrilled they are, 
and how President Trump has done this and done that. We don't know whether any of that's true. That's their spin. Uh, what we do know is that President Trump is, says that he is committed to a deal, to brokering a deal, that he will not impose a deal upon Israel, but he would love to be the person who brought about uh, a resolution of this terrible dispute, uh, this terrible conflict uh, between Israel and the Arabs. So he'd like to do that. We know that he considers himself to be the ultimate deal maker. But we also know uh, that uh, apart from the nicey nicey that he's been making with Mahmoud Abbas, um, he has set the Palestinians a very high bar for them. Um, he has said that they have to stop paying the families of terrorist salaries. He has said that they've got to stop uh, uh, teaching their children to hate and to murder. Um, and behind the scenes, I would guess uh, that he, if he hasn't already done so, he will be insisting that they abandon certain other items dear to them, such as uh, what they call the right of return, but which actually is their demand to flood Israel with Arabs and thus destroy it completely. Um, and uh, I suspect that he's going to be uh, insisting on these things as a precondition uh, for a negotiation, because without these things, uh, if, if the Arabs, if, if the Palestinians uh, uh, insist on continuing to pay salaries to the families of terrorists, if they insist on continuing to teach their children to murder Jews in Israel and to steal their country, if they uh, insist on continuing to uh, say uh, that they will never accept Israel as a Jewish state, which they are continuing to say, then there can be no deal, be by, by obviously, because their agenda is obviously still to destroy the state of Israel. And the interesting question to me is this, President, Bump, President Trump has set this bar. Um, I don't recall other presidents setting a bar like this. Uh, you know, these are the conditions you have to meet. Now, I suspect, and I'm not alone in thinking this, the Palestinians are not going to uh, uh, meet these conditions at all. They've already said they won't. So the question is, what is President Trump going to do then when he is faced with Palestinian rejectionism? Now, previous administrations faced with Palestinian rejectionism have pretended it's not. Um, they have been able to kind of finesse it that, you know, we'll all have a peace process anyway because we, none of us can think that there's any alternative. And that's been the mantra. There is no alternative to a peace process. So even if the Palestinians are continuing to say, we will continue to try and destroy Israel, there has to be a peace process. This is the madness that has made this conflict continue. And what President Trump should say, I don't, know, I don't know what he will do. I have no idea what he will do. But what he should do, if the Palestinians uh, are continuing to show that their aim is really to exterminate Israel, President Trump should say, in the art of the deal, I said, sometimes a deal isn't possible. Sometimes it is not possible to do the deal. And this is one such occasion, because you cannot do a deal uh, with, uh, a pe with people who wish to exterminate another country. You cannot negotiate with the non-negotiable agenda, which is an unconscionable agenda. And so I say to the Palestinians, uh, this is a situation where you make it impossible to make a deal. Um, your agenda is non-negotiable. Your agenda is unthinkable. And therefore, uh, you will be treated henceforth as diplomatic and political pariahs. You will get no money from me. You will get no money from the United States. You will get no diplomatic recognition from the United States. You will get no, no political initiatives from the United States. As long as you continue with this terrible agenda, if you abandon it, fine, then we can all talk. Then we can all progress towards a deal. Until then, you are pariahs. Now, that's what he should say. He should change the narrative completely. Uh, he should say, you know, um, uh, as the inventor of the art of the deal, I can tell you that this is where there is no deal possible and we have to have a completely different approach. And if he wants to be, as I think he does, the president who brought about peace in the region, it has to be peace with justice. And he can do more to progress proper peace in the region if he starts to tell the truth about this dispute. It is not a conflict over land, over the division of land. It is an attempt by the Palestinian side, the Arab side, to exterminate the state of Israel. The reason this dispute continues without end is because for all these years, the West has pretended it is not that thing at all. The West has pretended this is simply a dispute about land. It can therefore be resolved by negotiation. It can't. 
this is where the art of the deal is to say there is no deal possible. Now, the, the beautiful thing about the direction you just took this issue, Melanie, is taking for granted, mostly, close to 100%, that the, whatever deal Trump comes up with will be rejected by the Palestinian Arabs, as they always do. And then the real issue is what's going to be the price he's going to make them pay and finally telling the truth of who's to blame for the fact that there's no, uh, that there's no peace between yep. the two parties. That I, 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 I really do help, hope that's the truth, and we'll, and we'll see, but I think it's good that this conversation is going in that direction. The last issue I wanted to ask you about, since you are in America right now, uh, the big headline news dealing with American politics has been the firing of the FBI director, James Comey. Insight is into that whole ordeal taking place in the United States right now. Well, you know, I'm going around America talking to real Americans as opposed to fake Americans who are the media and the intelligentsia and all those sort of people. Um, joke. Um, and uh, real Americans are telling me, I mean, they, they are saying, thank goodness Comey's been fired at last. He should have been fired a long time ago. He's been out of control. And it, my, view, my view is that that is, that is true. Um, uh, he has been uh, show, he's shown himself to be not fit for the job. He's shown himself to be, uh, I was going to say, a, a partisan in the democratic cause. But of course, that wasn't the case either, because um, Hillary Clinton blames him, in fact, for restarting his investigation or announcing he was restarting his investigation into her email scandal uh, uh, just before the presidential election and thus scuppering her chances. I don't think that was actually the case, but anyway, that's what she believes. And it is an extraordinary thing that you have the Democratic Party, which for all this time has been blaming Comey uh, for uh, Hillary's uh, losing the presidential election, has been saying that he was uh, out of control, that he was wrong, that he was, uh, his judgment was appalling, uh, that he should be fired. They've been saying this uh, uh, variously for months. And only a few days ago, um, he, uh, uh, he came under Democratic, the fire from the Democratic Party uh, again uh, for apparently uh, mistaken, misstating himself uh, over the email scandal. And once again, there was all this crying out from the Democrats uh, that he was not fit for purpose, that he was bringing the entire office of the FBI ed, uh, director into disrepute and all the rest of it. So along comes President Trump and fires the man. And suddenly uh, the Democrats turn on a dime and say that President Trump has showed himself to be, an, uh, 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 to be acting unconstitutionally. He's acted unconstitutionally. It's an appalling thing. He's acted like a dictator. I mean, I'm watching the, you know, the TV uh, commentators and, and, and people in, in the media here in America and honestly, it's, it's, it's almost unbelievable how um, absurd and how over the top their reaction is. He's being called a fascist. At the same time, he's being called, you know, in bed with President Putin. He's been doing Putin's work for him. Um, he has been called a dictator. He's been called unconstitutional. I mean, he has explicitly the power to do this in the Constitution. Uh, Mr. Comey has now gone on record saying a president can fire his uh, FBI chief at will. There's nothing unconstitutional about it at all. Um, and, uh, you know, the whole thing is ridiculous. I mean, I, from what I read, uh, it would appear that um, the thing was not handled well uh, by President Trump at all. He appears to have um, uh, fired uh, Mr. Comey uh, without a due preparation with his own team, with Trump's team uh, in the White House. So they were left flat footed in terms of a response. And, you know, this is a kind of hallmark of this president, that he is uh, impulsive and uh, he doesn't obey any rules, including the basic rules of, of his own self-preservation. And this is worrying. I mean, I've always said that, you know, he has uh, a psychological a personality traits, which I find disturbing. Um, and, uh, they, you know, it's, it's, it's alarming that a man uh, who is um, a president of the United States um, is so impulsive and 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 so on, uh, but uh, and he he you know he he thinks with his gut. He, he he doesn't necessarily think with his brain. 
And these are not good things at all. But nevertheless, his gut is often, you know, as far as I can see, his gut is usually pretty, pretty well on target, his gut. Um, and I think he got it right with uh, Mr. Comey. Um, and, you know, famously, uh, Donald Trump said when he was a candidate, he, his intention was to drain the Washington swamp. And the more we look at this, the more it really is a swamp. I mean, you know, the, 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 um, the way in which uh, the uh, elements of the establishment, I don't know who they are, but they're clearly powerful people, are putting material into the public domain, which is designed all the time to undermine and to destroy President Trump is really quite significant. Now, I think I just get the impression here, you know, there's this tremendous war going on uh, from Beltway types uh, to get rid of this president. And as I say, talking to ordinary Americans, as I'm doing in a fairly large number, they're very much aware of this and they are desperate about it. They feel desperate about it because they feel that they can no longer rely upon the institutions of the state to safeguard democracy. They feel that people who are acting against um, not just President Trump, but acting against them, uh, for example, um, on you know, the, the, the howling down on campus, um, uh, the uh, uh, support for illegal immigration, um, this is being done at an institutional level. And when they try to correct it, when they try to use the law to correct these things, and to stand up for freedom and for the rule of law, they find themselves stymied by politically uh, driven, Democrat appointed judges and other uh, functionaries of the state who are preventing the rule of law from taking place and preventing the constitution from being upheld. And if you translate that into what's going on in the Beltway against President Trump, um, it's a really very alarming situation. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm hearing some very alarming um, uh, things being said by people uh, among, you know, among the voting populace who are very, very upset about all this. I think it's a really quite a dangerous, poten potentially quite a dangerous situation here. Yeah, definitely. And you definitely hit it on the head when you, when, uh, when the people feel hopeless because it's the actual institutions that are there supposed to protect the law there are the ones actually going against the law, which the biggest example you brought up was the actual sanctuary cities. Wow. All right. Melanie, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Sounds like this has been an unbelievable trip. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Avi, as ever. Good to see you.